This is All India Radio. In the program Spotlight, now we bring you a discussion on G7 meeting, its importance and expectation. The participants are Anil Vadva, former diplomat, and Nilova Roy Chaudhary, journalist. The United Kingdom has invited India to attend the G7 summit as a special guest. This summit is scheduled to be held in Cornwall in England. Joining us to examine why India's presence at these deliberations of the group of seven most uh, wealthy nations of the world is important. Now, there are suggestions that this invitation to India this time is an acknowledgement of the fact that despite the current state of the Indian economy, the world expects India to bounce back. Anil, would you agree with that assessment? The world expects India to bounce back. And also the fact that India has been invited to the G7 Leaders Summit in 2021 because of the fact that um, despite the 46% of global GDP coming from the G7 countries and uh, the G7 making up one-tenth of the world population, they see India as very important to the agenda for the G7 Leaders Summit in 2021. If you look at the agenda, which is on the table for them is leading the global recovery from the coronavirus while strengthening resilience against future pandemics. That's the first one. Second item on the agenda is promoting future prosperity by championing free and fair trade. Thirdly, tackling climate change and preserving the planet's biodiversity. And finally, championing global shared values. In all these, India has a major role to play. And that's also the reason why we see an Indian presence at the current uh, foreign and development ministers meeting. Besides the European Union, you also have the presence of India, Australia, South Korea, and uh, South Africa. Because all these countries are seen as important for the G7 agenda going forward this year, which will be held in June 2021 in Cornwall. As you rightly said, Anil, Australia, South Korea, and South Africa are also among the other nations specially invited to attend. Now, it, it's fairly clear that coordinating a global response to the pandemic will be an important part of their agenda this time. Can we expect to see some real-time decisions taken by these ministers on cooperation, you know, on vaccines, for example, or IPRs or something like that? Let's begin by going back to the point about uh, the invitation to India, which we referred to. I think um, the invitation of India was... Uh, also extended by Donald Trump, who would have hosted the summit in 2020, and he had also invited Prime Minister Modi, of course, due to the pandemic, that meeting never took place. But like uh, President Trump, Boris Johnson is also keen to expand membership of the G7, and that's why he's also invited Australia and South Korea's Prime Ministers to Cornwall, along with uh, the Indian Prime Minister. And of course, he's hoping that uh, the international community has been as a huge market and it's bringing a lot of attention to India. And we would also recall that successive Indian Prime Ministers had also been to you know, the G7 meetings, as many as five G7 summits earlier. It was called the G8 before. So that happened in 2005 in UK, in 2006 in Russia, 2007 in Germany, 2008 in Japan, and 2009 in Italy. And, of course, the world expected more out of India as far as rapid economic growth is concerned. But there's no denying its huge potential and its demographic credentials, which cannot be ignored. You know, here again, attending this meeting by the Indian Prime Minister will push uh, India's concerns. And Prime Minister Modi will have a chance to articulate our own ideas for a post-COVID world before the leaders of the world's most advanced nations. So that's a given. You rightly talked about the current situation when we are also looking at vaccine cooperation and how to tackle the pandemic issue, which is facing the world. It just so happens that at this point in time, India is facing a second wave. But India has also been in the forefront of vaccine production across the world and seen as a very important country in terms of vaccine production and distribution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm sure at this development foreign ministers meeting, the discussion would focus upon how India should tackle its current situation and, of course, the future of 
vaccine production, which is meant for the rest of the world as well. So this is an ideal opportunity to look at um, the foreign aid, etc., which is flowed in from about 40 countries. Given the current second wave in India, at the same time, India's own capabilities of ramping up production, pulling out the vaccination in its own country and also in other countries. Again, as you rightly pointed out, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has acknowledged that India is the pharmacy of the world and already supplies approximately 50% of the world's vaccines. And uh, obviously, they're planning to work more closely together given the situation globally at the moment where, say, the African continent hasn't even begun to get the vaccine. Now, the G7, which comprises United States, Canada, Japan, Britain, France, Germany, and Italy, also the countries which are India's strategic partners individually. So this in-person meeting that external affairs minister will have with his counterparts in all of these countries, are they just going to be like forerunner for what will happen at the summit meeting in June? Or does this kind of in-person meeting help to further develop you know, bilateral and multilateral relations? There is some amount of overlap in the agendas of the Foreign and Development Ministers Meeting and the G7 Leader Summit, which is going to come up in June in Cornwall and this year. So if you look at the agenda, which we had outlined earlier for the summit, that's uh, focused on four things, which is global recovery from the virus and strengthening resilience against future pandemics, also promoting future prosperity through free and fair trade. Thirdly, the climate change issue and preserving the planet's biodiversity. And finally, championing global shared values. Now, at this meeting that we are looking at right now, it's quite clear that there are um, similar agenda items um, which the foreign and development ministers are looking at. Of course, they're looking at um, the pandemic situation and how to uh, tackle the current situation and going forward, how to build towards the decisions to be taken at the summit in this regard. Secondly, some discussion would definitely take place on climate change and what should happen at the summit by way of uh, important decisions which need to be taken. But more importantly, I think it's also looking at the rules-based international system. And in terms of that, uh, we are focused on a lot of uh, current issues which are on the plate. So, for example, to the United Kingdom and the United States, the issue of Ukraine, as far as Russia is concerned, is important. In Asia, the coup in Myanmar is important. In um, Asia, also, the rules-based international system in the South China Sea and uh, the Chinese challenge is very important. In terms of climate, you have focus on women in particular, on the role of women going forward. And I think uh, there is some agreement between the United Kingdom and the United States already in terms of setting aside some funds for this purpose so that this decision could be taken up at the G7 Leader Summit in June. That's also a topic for discussion between the foreign and development ministers. All four of the members of the quadrilateral of four countries Australia, India, United States, and Japan are part of the foreign ministers of all four are going to be present in London at this point of time. Since the last summit quad happened just last month, they all, the leaders agreed to expand their collaboration to include this vaccine, ameliorating human suffering through the spread of vaccines and so on. Now, when external affairs minister Jai Shankar today met Tony Blinken, the U- U.S. Secretary of State. Would this whole issue of vaccine collaboration and so on have come up? Because at this point, this is probably the most glaring problem that the world is facing. The meeting which took place between um, Jai Shankar and Mr. Blinken, from what has been what come out of that meeting, We've had a discussion on expanding the vaccine production in India, looking at uh, resilient and reliable supply chains in this regard, but also the support by the United States um, to India in the current situation, especially with regard to oxygen supplies, remdesivir, and other medicines. And uh, finally, the situation in the Indo-Pacific region, and in that context, uh, Myanmar, what the United Nations can do, United Nations Security Council in particular, and also climate change. So these were the broad issues that were discussed. Now, if you look at the agenda of the Quad during that summit meeting, we had uh, three main focus areas. 
One is vaccine production in India and distribution in the Indo-Pacific. Secondly, strengthening the resilient supply chains and with focus on new technologies. And thirdly, climate change. So again, you see a overlap of these topics. Now, obviously, this meeting of the foreign and development ministers is going to be extremely important in taking forward this agenda. We sort of measures in with the objectives of the Quad as far as Indo-Pacific is concerned, but also in terms of the wider world where the vaccine, as you rightly pointed out, and reliable supply chains have become center stage and very important. In all this, India will play a very important role. Now, this particular week and this whole G7 summit, the United Kingdom has sort of said that this is a time for chance for the West to reassert its influence in all issues related not just to the coronavirus recovery and the global economic situation, but also climate change and so on. So these problems that they are trying to assert some kind of ascendance over, shall we say, countries like Russia and China. How uncomfortable would that make a country like, say, India feel in these circumstances? As we've seen in the past, agenda of the G7 is deliberated upon by all countries who are present, including the G7 plus the invitees. But it is not necessary that all of them are on the same page as far as the agenda items are concerned. Traditionally, what happens is that everyone puts forward their point of view and the G7 then tries to reach a consensus on the way forward with cooperation of all who are around the team. In this case, we've seen statements from the United Kingdom and Prime Minister Boris Johnson in particular because he's invited the leaders from India, Australia and South Korea to attend as guest countries. It is with a specific purpose to deepen the expertise and the experience around the table on items on the agenda which uh, we have before us. Now, his ambition is, of course, to use the G7 to intensify cooperation between the world's democratic and technologically advanced nations. So between them, the 10 leaders represent over 60% of the people living in democracies around the world. But at the same time, they play a very important role today in terms of being a catalyst for decisive international action to tackle the greatest challenges that we face. And of course, from the point of view of the UK and USA, the challenge from Russia and China are foremost on their minds. India looks at so-called challenge from Russia as different from the way the United Kingdom would look at it. And obviously, we look at uh, the world issues from a different perspective also. So I think the G7 will need to come to an agreement on the most pressing issues. And in my view, they will ultimately boil down to the issues like uh, vaccine development and distribution, climate change, and also building the resilient supply chains. On the political issues, there are always shades of differences which will persist. And as is usual in the previous summit meetings, all the countries who are participating will, of course, express their own views. But what will prevail is the consensus. It's interesting in this case that Britain has been talking, and particularly Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been talking a lot about the leading democracies of the world and them coming to try and establish a certain as you said, rules-based order. So can we expect some kind of more definitive response to the situation in Myanmar, for example? For India, certainly, that is an important part of the agenda. So there is no doubt that all countries who will be participating at the G7, at the Foreign Development Minister's meeting, as well as at the summit, obviously want uh, democracy to be restored in Myanmar. There's no difference on that. But on that issue, there is a difference in opinion. Because if you look at the countries in Asia, and especially countries like India, which are bordering Myanmar, and Myanmar is a very important neighbor of India, would try to make sure that all players in Myanmar are taken into account if a solution has to be found. And we've seen repeatedly that anything which is being imposed from outside has not worked in Myanmar. The ASEAN recently met and took the lead in this regard, and they came to the same conclusion. So I think everyone who's a player in Myanmar today, including the military, will have to find a solution to this together. Daniel, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. You were listening to a discussion on G7 meeting, its importance and expectation. The participants were Anil Vadva, former diplomat, and Nilova Roy Chaudhary, journalist. 
This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio. You can listen to it on our mobile app News on AIR. This program is also available on our website newsonair.com. You may email your opinion about this program at airnstalks@gmail.com.